Amen. God bless you this morning. Are you all good? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. You got mellow all of a sudden. Bless the Lord. Some quick announcements, then we got to get into the Word. It's so important this morning. How do you like the chairs? Yeah. <laughs> nice, right? Okay, so I, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, and actually you're really doing more a favor for the cleaning crew. See those little pockets in the back? Don't like stuff, napkins and old food and stuff like that in there, please, okay? <laughs> so watch your kids like you're putting Fritos and stuff, you know, tell them don't do that, right? All right, so, all right, so anyway, the chairs are very nice, obviously, and uh, it's probably about time, I would say, right? Those other ones are pretty, feel pretty hammer. We got our money's worth out of those, right? Anyway, here, what are we doing with those? We're keeping some of them for the church, but we're going to actually sell some of those because we don't need them all for $5 a piece. So if you're interested in getting some of those chairs, they're $5 a piece, and, um, on Saturday, January 30th is the day we're going to sell those. However, if you want to get them sooner and Pastor Brian has time to meet with you to do that, you can see Pastor Brian between now and then if you'd like to, okay? So we're going to be keeping some of those for the church, and then the rest we're just going to sell. And there's probably some of them, probably Pastor, we'll just have to throw away because they're really hammered, a couple of them, okay? All right? Praise the Lord. Uh, fasting and prayer was postponed to March 10th. You know why? Because we've had so much problems with all the stuff going on in our uh, you know, with everybody, with so many sicknesses and that thing, we really want to come together for that. So we're going to do that in March instead. We normally do it in January. <laughs> so put that aside. Uh, March 10th, 11th, and 12th. Anniversary dinner is March 14th. 25 years since I planted this church. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> right? And uh, you can sign up online. Also, uh, senior, uh, CLF membership class starts today at 1 o'clock in the high voltage room. And if you have a question about that, you can see Pastor Brian. Who has birthday around this time or last week or whenever? Anybody? <laughs> birthday. Birthday. Who else? Anybody else? Just you. Isn't that one? Aren't you happy? <laughs> All right. A happy birthday, wonderful sister. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. You too? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, you wonderful people. Happy birthday to you. Bless you, bless you. Amen, amen. Of course, we're missing many people. We're missing many people today. Many are watching from uh, uh, online with, with everything that's happening. But uh, this too shall pass, people. Amen? amen? This too shall pass. We'll get through this thing. And we've done really well here at the church, thank God. Uh, God has been gracious to us. Of course, some people struggle with things as we have to live in this world, but we've been doing very well. And uh, the church is open, amen? amen. Church is going to stay open, amen. amen? Church ain't ever closing again, amen. amen? All right, and if people can come or not come, that's up to them, but the building is open. Bless the Lord. God is good. I'm going to dismiss the uh, nursery uh, out the left-hand door in High Voltage Kids, which is grades 2 through 5. If you want to go to high voltage, out the right-hand door. And if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. Anybody? Anybody need a Bible? You all set? Great. Turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Book of Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, chapter 6. And when you're there in Isaiah, chapter 6, say amen, so I know you're there. Isaiah 6 is a famous uh, passage of Scripture, in which Isaiah writes incredibly powerful words. Now, last night, I, I just could not sleep. I kept waking up all night. I mean, I got hardly any sleep. And, and uh, when I woke up, I just kept thinking about this. I'd wake up thinking about this, and I try to go to sleep, maybe catch a little 15, 20 minutes, whatever, and I wake up again thinking about this. So, um, the question, the question the church has to ask is going to sound like an obvious question, and why would you even ask this question? But I will tell you, it is the question the church has to ask. And the church better answer it right. Now, when I say the church, I don't mean our church particularly, but the church in America particularly because this is the country we live in. <coughs> so I'm a pastor in America. I'm not a pastor in Poland 
So although I care about the Polish people, my main concern obviously would be the place in which I'm ministering. <laughs> what is the answer to this question? And the question is, who is God? Well, so, oh, Pastor, come on. Uh, you know, the Trinity, Jesus, you don't, the, don't you know this, Pastor? Haven't you read your Bible? <laughs> I ask it because we have a lot of false Jesus is happening in our modern society. We have a lot. You see, the name Jesus, the name Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, the name Jesus is, is just a name. Unless it's applied to the Jesus of the Bible. Because you know other people were named Yeshua? Yeah, other people had that name Yeshua, but and, and even today we have people that name their kids after Jesus. So the name, of course, but the name is not anything if it's not applied to the one we're talking about. Are you with me? Amen. No, it's just not just a name. It's the name. Amen. It's not a name. It's the name. Who is God? I mean, Pastor, really? We don't know who God is? Um, I'm not sure we do. And the reason I say that is because I do not believe that it's possible for us to completely understand God. I hope you agree with that. But who is this God? What we've made in modern society is a God who is, is man became God. Instead of God became man, dwelt among us. We have made God into whatever we fashioned as our modern human view of what God is. And therefore, we, and I say we, I don't mean me, and I don't mean you, but I mean we, the church in America as a whole, the visible church. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a visible church and invisible church. Well, you could see the church, you could see the visible church, but not everybody sitting in the visible church is part of the church. Who is this God we're talking about? God is holy. Holy, would you say that with me? Holy. And when you say holy right now, I want you just to relax for a moment and think about that. God is holy. This means that God is separate. He's separated. In the holiness of God, it's beyond anything you could possibly imagine in your mind. And, and as, I've, as I've studied the holiness of God, I can get some understanding, but we could never fully comprehend who it is that we're dealing with. Now, you're holding your place, but let me just read something to you. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, the Lord says to Moses, when you draw near to this place, take your sandals off your feet for... And the place where you stand is holy ground. The word holy in Hebrew means apartness, sacredness, to be set apart, to be taken completely apart from something else. So God, this, when God said to Moses, this is holy ground, he said, I have set this ground apart from everywhere else in the world, this particular spot for this moment, Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. In other words, this is set apart ground because the one who is holy is there. Now, Jesus is present everywhere. God's present everywhere. But his manifest presence happened in this place. Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Why am I reading this to you? Because in America now, God has become this buddy that we hang out with. He's our buddy pal. He's not. He's holy. He's God Almighty. He is holy and righteous and perfect and pure light, and there is no evil in him. He cannot lie. He is not the father of lies. The devil is God, is holy. Amen. And why don't we treat him that way? What is the sign of a false prophet in the Old Testament? The sign of the, over and over again, the sign of the false prophets in the Old Testament were to give you words of peace when there was none. To tell you words of peace when there is none. When the rebuke of God comes to Israel, 
The false prophets wouldn't re- bring a rebuke. They would bring the words of peace when there was none. We need repentance. I need repentance. I've got to turn from every wickedness that holds on to me. Because God is holy. He's holy. He's righteous. He deserves honor and glory. He does not deserve to be treated like he's our buddy down the street. We're going to call up and hang out with and have a beer. And you listen to the sermons today. Everything's about self-help. Like it's a 12-step program. Jesus is not a 12-step program. Jesus is the Savior of the earth and the world. Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Conquered death, hell, and the grave. He is holy and awesome. Now in Isaiah 6, we read here. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. So in this time, the year Uzziah died, the king, Isaiah, he puts that time frame, and he says, in that year, I had a vision from God. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a vision. I've had two very powerful visions in my life, two very, very strong ones that came to pass exactly as those visions were. But if you've ever had this type of a vision, you know that you are, and Paul mentioned it. He said, uh, um, I think it was Paul who said, whether I was translated or in my head, I don't know what, but something happened. And so if you've ever been, had a vision, like I had two of them in my life that were serious, it's almost like you completely leave the place that you're at and you just end up somewhere else. I can't explain it any other way. And you're just in this thing. And one of the visions I had was a powerful vision. I was actually driving at the same time. I'm driving. I had a vision. It was amazing. And I, I'm, I'm sure God must have been driving the vehicle because I don't know what was. I was just like this in this vision. And so Isaiah gets this, and, and he says some things. He says, look what he says. In the year King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up. There's a throne. High and lifted up. And then we see his train, which is royalty, the train in the back of his garment. This is talking about royalty. The train filled the temple. When the royal would walk in, they'd have a long train. God doesn't have a long train. His train fills the temple because he's the ultimate royalty. And above, verse 2, stood seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two, he did cover his face. Two, he covered his feet. With one, with two, he did fly. Now, the word seraphim is an interesting word. This is an angelic being, and the word means a fiery, like a fiery serpent, but not an evil serpent. So there was probably fire coming out of this angel's mouth. It was a fiery angel. And they were flying around, and they were yelling something to each other. They weren't even speaking to God. They were saying this to each other. Verse 2, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Two, he covered his face. Two, he covered his feet. Why his face? Humility before the Lord. His feet, why? Because he's, his steps were ordered of the Lord. His feet, his face are covered. And then they flew. Now, these six wings as Ezekiel's living creature, also in Ezekiel 1.4, and also John's four beasts, Revelation 4.8, also talks about these six-winged beings. And, he, and one cried unto another. And the word cry doesn't mean just said, but passionately screamed out as well as they possibly could. And you get this vision in your mind of Isaiah seeing the Lord lifted up high in the train from the temple and the angels, and they cover their feet and their face, and they're screaming out, Holy! Holy is the Lord! Holy! Holy is the Lord! Holy! And we need the church to yell, Holy is the Lord! Holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord, holy, sacred, set apart, purity, no sin at all. No deceit, no deception, no lies, no disorder. Holy is the Lord. We approach God how? 
Well, the Bible says we can boldly approach the throne of grace and make our petition known. But does that mean we should boldly approach the throne of grace with disrespect? God is holy. And the church better come back to that. We don't have a right to disobey and disrespect the things of God. We don't have it. He's righteous and holy. Look what it says. Again in verse 3, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Why? Because the creation speaks of the creator. Verse 4, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Smoke in the Bible is symbolic of the presence of God. Remember they were, they were led by smoke, right? And in the temple, when they dedicated the place filled with smoke and power and anointing, they couldn't even stand to minister because of the anointing. So smoke represents the presence of the anointing of God, the leading of God. And he's seeing this vision in Isaiah. He's watching all this, and I know personally what it's like to have one of these and what happens to you. You just go, and it's weird because there's nothing else competing. When I went into two visions, there was nothing else competing for my thoughts. At the time, I just I'll focused right on And that's what Isaiah, he's focused on what the Lord is showing him. I don't know that I could have thought of anything else when I had those two visions. I don't think he could have either. He cried one another, holy, holy. And the posts, the door moved, the voice from the cry in verse 4. Verse 5, then said I, this word. Now, this little word is a power-packed word. Then said I, woe. 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 Remember when Jesus said that in the New Testament? Woe unto you. That term, woe, is a very heavy term. It means, uh, I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do, because this particular woe is married to the next thing he says. Stay with me. Woe. It's in the Hebrew, a passionate cry of absolute despair. Then he goes, woe is me, for I am undone. So Isaiah sees God, his throne. He sees the train. He sees the angels. He hears the holy, holy. And in this picture, he comes to, woe is me, I am undone. And the word undone in the Greek means to cease to exist, cut off and destroyed. Isaiah sees this picture of God, and all he can feel is, whoa, I'm cut off, I'm destroyed. I can't look, I can't experience this. This is too much for me. That's how holy God is. He's holy and he's righteous, and he deserves honor and glory and respect. Honor and glory and respect. We read, For then he said, Then said I, Woe is me. I am undone because of I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What happens to Isaiah when he gets this vision of God is this the contrast between him and God. And when you come into the presence of the Lord, you can't really do that without feeling, to some extent, the contrast between us and God. When the anointing and power comes on, you ever, you ever have what I call the holy dread? What is that? Well, when, I'm getting, when the Lord's convicting me of something, and just going, no. Okay. God... Is not Listen, he's called our friend because we're not his enemy. Amen? We come to Christ. But my friends, let us never cheapen, bring down, in any way, almighty God. And sometimes, in our modern way of saying, well, you know, God's not impressed with this, and he's not impressed with that, so I could just do whatever. 
You know, that's a bad attitude. It was in Malachi that God was upset with that kind of attitude because they, they were doing, giving things to God that they wouldn't even give to their human leaders. You've got your best. He certainly deserves that. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Look what it says after he's completely undone. I'm cut off and destroyed in verse 6. One flew of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs off the altar. This is the picture of the altar in fire, purification. And he took that off the altar, and he brings it up, and he touches his lips. Number seven, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken from thee, and thy sin is purged from thee. And in this vision of holiness, and I'm undone, and I'm all done, and I'm dead, man. I can't even stand or even look anymore at this who is holy, Christ, in this picture. Sends the angel with the coal from a man of unclean lips, and he touches his lips. His sin is purging. Did he ask him to fix himself? He didn't ask him to fix himself. The angel took and touched his lips, and he's a man now, clean lips, the sin is purged from him by mercy and by grace. The angels know how holy God is. We ought to know how holy God is. You still with me? Good, verse 7, he laid upon his mouth and said, Lo, I touched your lips, thy iniquity is taken from you, your sin is purged. You know, say, my friends, Holiness equals wholeness. Holiness equals wholeness. And then at verse 8, it says this. In this vision, also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. How could Isaiah see a vision like this? He's undone. He's dead. Forget it. I can't. And all of a sudden, send me. I'm ready to go. Why? Because why? Why? Because he touched his lips with the coal of the altar. Christ makes the difference. Mercy makes the difference. Yes, he is holy. We are not without him holy. With him we are. Somebody say amen. And yes, Christ is holy. But you understand, once Jesus touches you with the coal from the altar, you can now say, here I am, send me. Because you're not saying it because you're this and that, but other you believe in he who died on the cross and rose again, who is holy. His holiness and his righteousness is imputed into us. But how we respond to that in our everyday lives is going to make it either powerful or dormant. Which is it? See, if we don't respect his holiness, we will not respect his word. Some of you know me many years. You respect my word. Some of you, if someone said to you, well, Pastor Dave said this, you would say, some of you know me for many years, you'd say, well, he wouldn't lie to you. He's telling you the truth. Because you respect me, you respect my word, right? If you don't respect the word, you don't respect God. This is why the church must come back to holiness. It is not okay to live with someone when you're not married to them. It is not okay to run out on your spouse. Hello. It is not okay to go around having sex outside of marriage. It is not okay. It is not okay to worship the government either. It is not okay to covet what belongs to other people and think it belongs to you. We must repent. We must think about being holy. And I'm thinking to myself all night waking up. I woke up so many times. I mean, I just kept waking up thinking about this. I've been thinking to myself, if I'm in that room 
in that vision, and I see, G- I see God is training. Will I be undone? Should I be undone? Well, in my human condition, yes, but not with Christ in me. You'll notice that after the cold touched his lips, he wasn't undone anymore. He was ready to go. Here I am. See, the problem with having a conservative worldview without Jesus is that you have nothing to stand on from the standpoint of absolute truth. It's not good enough to just be conservative. You could stand before God. What were you? I'm a Republican. You think God's impressed with that? I'm not impressed with that. It's not conservatism that saves you. It's Christ. Now, if you know Jesus, you're obviously going to be conservative on these issues because the Bible's clear about it. But the very fact that we now have so many people say they're conservative, don't go to church, don't walk with Christ, don't care what the Word of God says, why are you conservative? Based on what? Based on what? Your viewpoint as a believer comes through the Scriptures because He is holy. Can you have better glasses than holy glasses? I don't think so. If you want truth, you go to God's Word. Who holy is the Lord? Sin is evil. And God is pure good. Now, let me just help you understand some things. You probably have heard people say this. What's the big deal with sin? Some people say, well, it's not a big deal. I mean, I didn't, do, I didn't kill anybody. You might have heard people say, well, that's a, it's not a big deal. I didn't do this. I could have done that. I'm not an axe murderer. Well, that's a great person to compare yourself to. And all of us are glad you're not that. (laughs) But the reason why people think sin is no big deal, stay with me, it's very important, because they compare sin to what the sinful, they they compare sin, their sin, to the possible sinfulness of man. In In other words, what are we capable of as human beings? The humanity is capable of pretty horrific things. We all read our history books, right? And we can see it in our own lives as we look at the world today. We see so many evil things. So um, people compare sin to what they're capable of. Well, it's not that I, don't, I didn't kill nobody. You see? And this is why they think everything's a small sin and no big deal. But you see, God is holy. He's omnipresent, everywhere present, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnibenevolent. He is love. You cannot compare your sin to what you're capable of. You have to compare your sin to he who is holy. You understand the difference? This is what people do. Well, I'm not a bad, I'm a good person. You've heard that a million times. What are you saying, I'm not a good person? I'm saying before God... You will be undone. And you will melt like wax. If God was to reveal himself fully to Isaiah, Isaiah would have died. Don't compare your sin to what you're capable of. Compare our sin to the holiness of God. And God is pure and righteous and in perfect order. And that's why... Any sin is sin. Now, theologically, any sin will separate you from God. But let me make this clear. Theologically, just on a side note, it is not true when people tell you all sin's the same. That is not true. That's a lie. Please understand that is a lie. Theologically, all sin will separate you from God. But not all sin is the same. We read your Bible. God put certain things, he said, you've got to remove some people from the church if they do certain things. Those sins are worse here on earth, understand. They have more ramifications. But theologically, any sin will separate you from God. You say, well, I, what do you mean? I just stole the pen. What's the big deal? God is holy. Well, that's not a big deal. I stole the sandwich. I didn't pay my bill. God is holy, righteous, perfect, power. You will melt if you stand next to him. You're done. Christ. 
Christ, amen. Revelation tells us in Revelation 1 verses, 1, verses 14 through 16, the hair on his head was like white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet are like fine brass as the refined in the furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters and has in his right hand the seven stars in his mouth were a sharp two-edged sword. His appearance was like sun shining brightly. Your buddy? I don't think so. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy. The knowledge of the holy. The knowledge of the holy. The knowledge of the holy one is understanding. Hmm. Now in 1 Peter, I'll just read it to you. Chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says this. But as he who is called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Now that word can make you very nervous. Be holy as he is holy? I mean, is this telling us to be perfect like God is? Thankfully, it is not. It's telling us very clearly, be separate. In your behavior, be different, be separate. Be separate from those in the world who are doing crazy things. Let them see a change in our behavior. Let them see a difference between those who worship the Holy One of Israel and those that do not. Be separate, be different, be sanctified, be sacred, be something else. In our behavior towards one another and towards the world, our business dealings, everything, well, how do we behave? Are we like the world? There's a lot of folks that run around and go, I prayed a prayer. Jesus come into my life, and, you know, I prayed the prayer. The, God, the preacher said pray it, so I'm all set. They don't go to church. They don't read the Word. They they're not saved. You're saved when you get born again. And when you get born again, you are not the same. I'm going to tell you right now. You're not going to be perfect and you're going to screw up, mess up, and you're going to sin sometimes because you're human. But you are not the same person. You can't be. Not when the Holy Ghost comes in you. Forget it. There's no way you could be the same person. You can't help it. And the Lord messes the whole thing up with the sin thing. You can't even enjoy yourself anymore with it. Because when you do, you feel bad. Come on. Mess that whole thing up. <laughs> I'll tell you, man. You can get mad at the politicians, but in my personal opinion, the church is the problem. I mean, Christian people have got to start acting like Christian people. Because holy is the Lord. If the Lord calls us to pray, and your pastor says, God is calling us to pray He's, as your leader, calling us these days... Now, you may not be able to make it for some reason. That happens. And it's okay. I'm not putting a trip on you. Don't get me wrong. But if you ask, if you have to ask, do I really want to go pray? Do I really? You better ask yourself. You better go look in the mirror and ask yourself a question. Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Amen. Which house is he talking about? He's talking about this one. Not just the corporate, but here, right in here. I just think we ought to think about the lion of the tribe of Judah as the lion of the tribe of Judah. I just think we ought to think of the risen Savior as the risen Savior. I feel like if, if Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, we ought to take notice of that. I think if Jesus was in the tomb after being murdered on the cross that, and, he, and he came back to life, this is probably important. Why? Because he's holy and righteous and perfect and in perfect order, and in no way is there any deceit in him. For when, you, when we finally do stand before God, when it's all said and done, and he changes us so we can, we shall be like him, he's then going to reveal himself fully in all of his glory. And it's going to not kill you. Because Jesus took the coal. And he made you clean. Because he rose from the dead and he died on the cross. And he's coming back again. 
and he's holy, and he's made you holy. So he said, if he made you holy, be holy. If I made you separate, be separate. If I made you able to do things, do them. Do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Holiness is wholeness. And I read this to you. Close your eyes for a minute. Band, come back up, please. Just close your eyes and, and listen for a moment. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Let me read it to you again. Close your eyes, open your hearts, hear the word of the Lord. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never, say never. never. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. God, listen to me, please. This is so important. It's not just fearing the Lord. It is fearing the Lord's bringing the wisdom, but it's not just that. It's the holiness of God letting it permeate us. I haven't fully done that yet. I'm working on that. God always responds to repentance. Always responds to humility. So let us sing. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We're going to sing this song. And when you sing this song this time, I want you to feel to think about this passage of scripture and this vision Isaiah had. And, and, and as you sing, Lord, I just want to be caught in that. I just want to be caught in that in that whole deal where you take that coal, you put it to the lips, and then you just do something to me that makes me say, Here I am, send me, I am gonna win the lost. I am going to serve God. I'm going to win the loss. I'm going to make disciples. Sing it with that attitude. Would you stand, please? Start that song. Thank you. 
just at church, you never ask Christ to be your Savior. And I don't want to let this moment go by without giving you an opportunity to do that. If you have never asked Jesus, this Holy One we're speaking of, the Holy One we're speaking of, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, you want to ask him, to, you want to call upon the name of the Lord, you can do right now. Just make a decision right now. And just get out of your seat and come up here and we'll pray with you. Up there? Yeah. You can do it. Just, we'll just pray with you. It's no big deal. Is there anybody before we end who would say, I want to give my life to Christ? Is there anybody? And just wait a moment. What we sing is if you want to give your life to Jesus, just walk up front. We'll pray with you. face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace that passes understanding. May the Lord anoint you this week, put his glory upon you, touch you physically, and heal you. May you be whole physically, financially, relationally, emotionally, in every way, God's glory in your life. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord God, for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we pray right now also for Brother Max, our brother, and my good friend, Lord God, and she's still not well, and I'm praying, Lord, that we would, you would send your power even now to touch his body and to burn out this sickness and heal him completely, heal his lungs, Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name, even now, and heal our people, we pray. We thank you for your grace, ask you to bless the food and our fellowship, and also as the offering is given in the back boxes, Lord God, we pray you'd expand it to the work of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Holy is the Lord. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have some food and fellowship. Hey, this is Pastor Dave. I'm the lead pastor of Christian Life Fellowship Church. Thanks so much for watching the broadcast. It's very important to us to uphold the scriptures. In the world we live in today, it seems that everybody is compromising the word of God. At Christian Life Fellowship, we're simply not willing to do that. 
If you appreciate that, there's a way you can help us. Like everything, it takes resources to do this broadcast. If you would like to help us, that would be great. You can click the link right below on your screen. I want you to know that if you can't help us, we still are thrilled that you're watching and hope that it blesses you every week. So join us next week at the same time to hear the word of God without filters. That's what we need, all of us. God bless you in Jesus' name. I'll see you next week. Amen.